Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another exciting edition of Free Advice Friday. Looking forward to hanging out with you for a little bit today and answering some of your voiceover business and marketing questions. Uh, hopefully, giving out some free advice that will help you to find new leads, grow your business, come up with some better strategies for marketing, make marketing a little bit more fun for you, uh, wh whatever it is that you need. Uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, so I'm going to hang out with you here for a little bit today and answer some of those questions for you. So thank you for joining. As always, I do have to say big announcement, big announcement, the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas. The contest is officially open which means you can now officially enter. And I can tell you that there are so far just just under $18,000 worth of prizes that have been collected for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas, which is absolutely incredible. And uh, no doubt some more prizes are gonna be coming in as well. But you can see here, uh, these are some of Santa's helpers this year. So Joseph Briano, J. Michael Collins, Ann Ganguza, Cliff Selman, Dave Walsh, Everett Oliver, Uncle Roy, George the Tech, K. Bess, Hunter Peterson, the Demo Dream Team, all contributing prizes to the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas this year. And then, of course, if you scroll a little bit further down the page, lots of different bonus prizes donated as well. Brad Hyland, Voice Sam, uh, Impressive Talent, David Alden, Ian O'Donnell, Beth Windsor-Stewart, Nimble, Jim Franck, the V123 Pros, uh, Nadia Marshall donating from Blueprint Courseware. So uh, some amazing prizes that are up for grabs. Last year, uh, we ended up doing just over $19,000 worth of prizes for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas. I think we had 58 winners. Uh, so this year, we are definitely on course to probably do at least that all over again. So uh, very much looking forward to it. So that is, uh, that's the announcement on the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas. Actually, you know what? You're probably like, great, Mark, but how do I enter? Well, why don't I put that in the chat? 12 B.O. gifts. There you go. Uh, so I just put that in the chat. Uh, it's vopreneur.com forward slash 12 VO gifts. Vopreneur.com forward slash 12 VO gifts if you would like to enter the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas. So that's the rundown on that, but uh, let's carry on with Free Advice Friday, shall we? So uh, welcome, Dion. Welcome, Fiber. Thank you so much for hanging out. If you do have a question that you would like to ask for Free Advice Friday, this is your opportunity to do it. Uh, feel free to Type your question into the comments, and I will certainly do my best to, to answer that for you. Um, while waiting for questions to pop up, I want to mention, by the way, if you have not checked out the latest episode of the podcast, which is available on this YouTube channel, uh, but also available at vopreneur.com and also available wherever fine podcasts are given away for free, uh, the new episode with Sean Pratt was absolutely fantastic. I wanted to have a conversation with Sean about audiobooks because I don't know anything about them other than I'm afraid of them. Uh, so I thought Sean would be a really good guy, somebody who's voiced over a thousand audiobooks in his career, uh, and he's been doing it for a long time. So I thought, I'll have him on the show, we'll talk about audiobooks. And, and that was certainly what my original intention was, but the conversation ended up evolving. And so I, I was hesitant to even put audiobooks in the title of the episode because I was afraid that some people would be like, oh, I'm not interested in audiobooks, and then they won't listen to it. Uh, this was not a podcast for audiobook narrators. This was a podcast for voice actors, period. This was a podcast for voice actors. Uh, for any voice actor doing any kind of voice acting across any genre, uh, you're going to walk away with some amazing tips uh, from this interview with Sean. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to that one yet, check it out. It's called Acting and Audiobooks with Sean Pratt. And again, uh, at vopreneur.com, right here on the YouTube channel, or of course, wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. So... What do you guys want to talk about today for Free Advice Friday? What questions can I answer for you? If you've got a question, this is your opportunity. Type it into the queue, uh, or type, sorry, type it into the comments. Put a queue beside it when you type it. That way it pops out on the screen for me. Uh, but I am happy to hang out uh, for a little bit and answer some of your voiceover business and marketing questions. I see that I'm still brushing some sawdust off of me. I was, uh, my mom is here today. She's using my workshop uh, I got some some tools in my workshop, some woodworking tools, and so I was out there helping her with something just before Free Advice Friday, and apparently I didn't get all the sawdust off. So there you go. I was helping my mom. What do you want? So who's going to ask the first question? Super excited about the contest. I know some of you guys are uh, talking about it in the chat there. I see you're very excited about the contest too. Uh, I can tell you that there are some demos 
that are going to be given away. Just throwing that out there. I can tell you that there is a Neumann TLM 103 Anniversary Edition that is going to be given away. Uh, you know, just just a couple of little hints. Uh, so, you know, it's worth signing up for if you haven't signed up for it already. All right. Question on rates. Do you include a session fee whether or not you are using Source Connect? Yeah, so the session fee doesn't actually have anything to do with how you are conducting the session. The session fee is basically the, what, the session fee is your time. So you are being paid for your time. So uh, particularly in the broadcast space, session fee and usage were, were the way that things were done because if you had to come into the studio, so say they called you into the studio to record live in person, for example, you would get paid a session fee, which was the payment that you would receive for your time for coming into the studio. And then the usage was what they would pay on top of that for wherever the, the spot ultimately aired. And so if you were not, uh, so let's say that the, it was supposed to be uh, a, a $250 session fee and $750 for usage for wherever the commercial was going to run. So $1,000 total. You go in, you record the commercial, but then they decide, oh, you know what? We're going in a different direction. Um, we're not going to use your audio. Then you would lose the usage fee because they didn't use your audio, but you would still get paid your session fee because you came in and recorded the session. And so the, the session fee is what accounts for your time. So there's a lot of different ways that voice actors handle it. Uh, for me, generally speaking, I will add a session fee for a directed session, um, but I usually try to bake it into the rate because I don't want to give my clients a line list of all of the different things that they're paying for. So I will usually just give them one number, but know that the, the session fee has been calculated in. Another area where session fees definitely come into play is when you're doing revisions. And so let's say you've already done the project, but then they come back and they want to make a bunch of script changes or something like that. You need to get paid for your time for going in and doing those. And so having some sort of a session fee or uh, for me, I, I have a one hour and a 30 minute for revisions. And so I'll charge them the 30 minute session fee for the revisions. And unless there's a lot, obviously it takes me longer to do it. Um, but that's, that's how that works. So, uh, that's the difference between the session fee and the usage. And, and hopefully that answers your question. And says podcast question, what's your advice on some good ways to promote it to a wider audience? Okay. So Obviously, social media is one of the places that you're going to be looking, and I would say that you need to be using the hashtags on social media that your audience, your desired audience would be using, right? So keep that in mind. If you're doing a, a show about woodworking, then figure out what the hashtags are that the woodworkers are following and use those hashtags to try to distribute it uh, and get it noticed by a wider audience. So sharing it across social media. Um but also sharing it across social media more than once. I think this is one of the areas where we, we get nervous. We're like, oh, I already posted it on Twitter or X. I already posted it on LinkedIn. You're making the assumption when you do that that every single one of your followers sees every single one of your posts. And that is absolutely not the way it works, which is why it's okay to share things across social media multiple times because – the audience that sees your stuff on LinkedIn on Monday morning might be a completely different audience from the audience that sees your stuff on LinkedIn on Thursday afternoon, for example. Um, so rule number one, I would say, is make sure you're sharing it across all the different social media platforms using the hashtags that your desired audience is using. The second thing I would say is when you are sharing it across social media, one, do not blitz it to all the social media simultaneously at the exact same time. And two, make sure that you are staggering out across social media and posting multiple times because you can share it multiple times. You can write a different post each time, but you can absolutely share the link multiple times. The third thing I would say is look for ways to repurpose your content. So one of the things that I've started doing on the YouTube channel, you, you can see if you go onto my YouTube channel, I take my one hour interview, but I might grab five or six short clips from that interview, 60 second clips. And I will use those shorts on YouTube throughout the week to drive traffic back to the main interview. And so consider how can you repurpose your content as well? Can you make short clips? Can you turn some of the quotes into graphics using a service like Canva or something like that? So I think that's one of the other things that you can do. I think when you have guests on, 
Make it as easy as humanly possible for your guests to share your podcast. So put together a package for them. And maybe that includes uh, a wide social media graphic, um, like widescreen, like, you know, you know, if you're holding your phone this way. Um, but then also make sure that there's an, an upright, a vertical graphic. So if you're holding your phone this way so that they can put it in their Instagram stories, maybe you share a square version in case they want to post it on their on their Instagram grid. Make sure that you give them a link back to the podcast directly. So if you provide them with all of the tools that they need, they're probably much more likely to do it. So those are a couple of things that I think that you could do uh, for free, right? We could always get into paid strategies and stuff like that as well. But but those are a couple of things that I think that you could do that would, would help you to get it out to a, a little bit wider audience. Have you ever had a producer slash client on the podcast? Would be cool to hear more from the client perspective. It's actually something that I've thought about, but can I be perfectly honest with you why I have not done it? And great question, by the way. The reason why I have been afraid to do it is because if I bring a producer onto the show, I am so scared that a thousand voice actors are gonna email that producer as soon as the show is done asking to get on the roster. And I would feel sick about that. Uh, and maybe that sounds stupid, but that is legitimately the reason why I have not brought a client uh, or, or a producer or somebody like that on the show. I have debated it a lot. Trust me, a lot. I think that there are things that voice actors probably need to hear uh, from some of these producers when it comes particular, uh, particularly to the marketing side of things. But I just know that if I do that, that that poor person is going to get absolutely hammered with marketing emails after the episode is dropped. And so for that reason, uh, I've been very, very cautious, uh, very apprehensive about doing it. Nick says, just starting out in narrating VO, building a small and online presence, but I'm also so new that I have little to showcase. What marketing approach uh, do you suggest for a newbie? Um, I think you can still talk about what you have to offer. I think you talk about your services. I think about uh, you, you can talk about your studio. You can talk about what it's like to work with you. You can talk about um, the different genres of voiceover you do. You know, you could talk about some of the training that you've done potentially. Uh, so those are things from a strictly speaking from a voiceover standpoint, those are some of the things that you could absolutely talk about while you're trying to build up that portfolio and, and trying to get some some work and things like that that you could share. But also don't be afraid to talk about you as a person. Part of the reason why clients will ultimately connect with us is because maybe we're, we're making a connection with them on a more personal level outside of strictly voiceover and outside of the booth. And so that's why I do think that it's okay that, that a certain percentage of your, your social media content reflects back on just who you are. I think we all have different things that we can bring to the table as well that, that we can talk about. Uh, you know, like for example, I'm a small business owner. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a solopreneur. And so... I'm a VOpreneur, better say that one too. Uh, so what are the things that are relevant to me outside of voiceover? Small business tips, marketing advice, sales advice, social media tips, pro tips for using a particular social media channel, um, productivity, time hacks, all of these sorts of things, right? These are things that all have relevance to me, not strictly as a voice actor, but as a business owner. And so uh, those are things that I can talk about as well and, and share some things that I'm learning or using or things that are helping me. And he says, LinkedIn, I've seen a lot about algorithms being modified to try to bring it back to mostly business content. Any details on that? Um, the, the one thing that I can tell you about the LinkedIn algorithm is that it is focusing more on your network. So there was a period where content was being pushed to a much wider audience, right? So you could post something and a percentage of the people who are in your network were going to see it, but a very large percentage of people who were not inside of your network were going to see it. And the feedback on that was apparently that people didn't like it as much. And so LinkedIn is now focusing more on making sure that your content goes to the people who are in your network because the assumption is, and I don't know why nobody thought of this in the beginning, but the people who are connected with you might actually want to hear from you. <laughs> who could have imagined? Uh, so that is that is one of the things that I, I know about the algorithm is the change is going more to who is in your network. I think the algorithms are also paying more attention to who you're engaging with. And so this is where you have to be careful. If you're a voice actor connecting with other voice actors and engaging with content from other voice actors exclusively, then the algorithm is going to assume that you want more of that. And it's going to recommend more voice actors to connect with. It's going to show you more content from voice actors. And, and, and you know, it's going to try to build the network around that. Whereas uh, if you are using LinkedIn as a way to connect with 
e-learning developers and instructional designers, and those are the people that you are regularly engaging with, those are the people that you are regularly sending connection requests to, um, then the algorithm is going to say, oh, this, you know, Mark seems to want to connect with more instructional designers and e-learning developers, so let's recommend more instructional designers and e-learning developers to him. And so I think those are some of the things um, that you have to pay attention to with the algorithm and, and, and how it works. All right, Stevie says, is the monthly retainer business model still viable slash feasible? Could you theoretically bring about more relative financial stability? I think that there are opportunities for that. I think probably the number one opportunity for that would be in the IVR space. I think working out deals with businesses for X number of prompts, you get to decide. And maybe you create a small, medium, and large package, for example. Um, but for X number of prompts per month, it is going to cost X per month. So let's just, for easy math, let's just say that you came up with a package that was $100 a month, right? So they can pay for they can pay $100 a month and get X number of prompts, $1,200 for the year. But if they paid for the entire year up front, then you would give it to them for $1,000, for example. And so now you've just got the $1,000 up front knowing that you're going to be able to provide or you're going to be obligated to provide X number of prompts for them per month, which they may or may not take advantage of. That part is ultimately not your responsibility, but creating the package is. And so where there are opportunities for bulk, consistent bulk and ongoing work, I think there is a possibility for a retainer structure. And like I said, IVR, I think, is probably one of the places where that makes the most sense. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for coming and hanging out. Uh, if you're enjoying the broadcast so far, if I've answered your question, if you've learned something, could you do me a favor? Hit that like button. I would certainly appreciate it. The new venture, the Mark Scott Witness Protection Program. That's right. This is where the guests that come on my podcast and I don't want to get inundated with marketing uh, emails, this is where they have to go. They have to go into the Mark Scott, uh, the Mark Scott program, uh, the Witness Protection Program. Oh my goodness. The fact that we even have to joke about something like that tells you that you know that it's true. Again, if you've got a question that you would like to ask, feel free to type that question into the comments. Put a Q beside it, uh, and it makes it a little bit easier for me to see it on the screen. Uh, but I'm certainly happy to try and answer as many questions as I can on the business and marketing side of voiceover, whatever you would like to, to talk about. Uh, that's what Free Advice Friday is all about. So, uh, of course, don't be shy. Uh, certainly happy to answer some questions for you. Um, let's see. What else? What else is going on? The 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas. For those of you that are jumping in late, just a friendly reminder that the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas is available now. Uh, you can sign up for it now if you go to vopreneur.com forward slash 12 VO gifts. That is vopreneur.com forward slash 12 VO gifts. There it is right there, the sign up page. Make sure, by the way, all of the fields are required. So name, email address, uh, it says state, but it's not limited to the United States. So just put in your province, your country, whatever. It's not specifically going to uh, ding you for that. Uh, so, uh, but that just helps me to differentiate. For example, if two Joe Smiths sign up, um, you know, then the state might be the thing that helps me to differentiate which Joe Smith it was. Uh, but make sure that you sign up. You are only allowed to enter once, and I cannot clarify that enough. You are only allowed to enter once. It is an absolute pain in the patoot, but I literally go through every single entry. This is the, somebody made the joke. He's making a list and checking it twice. That's exactly what I'm doing. I literally go through every single entry. And if I find that you have signed up under two different email addresses, you will be disqualified. And every year there are people who get disqualified. So please, please, please uh, do not try to sign up under multiple email addresses. You will be disqualified. Contest rules are on the page. One entry per person. The entry deadline is December 20th at six o'clock Eastern. Do not attempt to sign up under multiple email addresses. You will be disqualified. Even though it's there, people will still do it. Prizes cannot be exchanged or redeemed for cash. Prizes are not transferable. 
Uh, all the winners will be announced during a broadcast right here on this YouTube channel. That's going to happen on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 12 p.m. Eastern. You do not need to be present to win, but of course you would want to be present to join in on the fun. And I hope that you will be present to join in on the fun. Nick says, best resources for VO agreements slash contracts and templates. Uh, there is one thing, hang on, let me look it up. Uh, there is one book that can be particularly helpful. It is called Voice Over Legal by Rob Sigampeglia. Uh, Rob is a voice actor, very respected in the community, uh, but he also happens to be an attorney. Uh, I have hired Rob several times in the past for some different things. And he does have a book that does offer uh, several different examples of contracts, agreements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oops, so that might be something that you wanna check out. Uh, so there, I just put that in the chat. Actually, I can just show you that. There it is right there, Voice Over Legal. That's the book. Uh, so if you see that one, it's available on Amazon or you know wherever you buy books. Uh, but I did just put the link in the chat on that one. So that would be one place that I would check out uh, for trying to come up with some agreements, contracts, et cetera, that you can use. Stevie says, better to follow up three or five days after the initial email. Uh, I think for me, I'm probably gonna do five days, but I'm also gonna pay attention to when those five days fall, right? If that if that fifth day falls on a Saturday, then you know I'm gonna wait a couple days and follow up on the Monday probably or whatever. But, but generally, I think probably five days isn't bad. Uh, I know there are people that would disagree that say the sooner you can get in, the better. I don't wanna feel too pushy. I'm worried if I come in at three days, I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but it, it feels like maybe it's gonna be a little bit pushy. What are some of the online payment services that voice actors usually use? I'm trying to decide if I should use something like PayPal, Stripe, or something else. Thanks for great content. Okay, ah, this is a fantastic question. My whole thing is the more ways that you have to get paid, the easier it will be for you to get paid. Um, so in my own business, I use PayPal. I use Stripe for processing credit cards. I have um, bank accounts in two different countries for clients who want to use direct deposit. Uh, so I have a Canadian and a US for clients that want to do direct deposit Canadian or direct deposit in the US. Um, I accept check. I have accepted Western Union uh, in the past. There are certain clients that I've worked with overseas who prefer to use Western Union. Fine, I'll do Western Union, doesn't matter. Uh, but the bottom line for me was the more ways that I have to get paid, the easier it is for clients to pay me. My preferred payment method is direct deposit. Obviously with direct deposit, I can avoid merchant account fees or credit card fees. So I, I kind of appreciate that. I also know that when I do direct deposit, if I'm working in multiple currencies, I am generally going to get a better exchange rate from my bank than I am going to get from PayPal, for example. PayPal destroys me on, on exchange, which is one of the reasons why I don't like using it, but I do make it available because I know a lot of people do use it. I'm a huge fan of Stripe. I've been using Stripe for years. I have multiple pages set up on my website, secure pages for my clients, uh, clients that you can use credit card to pay in uh, Great British Pound, that can use to pay in US dollars, and that can use, uh, that can pay in euros as well. Uh, so I always try to process the currency in, or process the payment in their local currency as well. Makes it a little bit easier for them. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's a lot of different services that are out there. Another service that's very popular that I do not use, but I know a lot of voice actors do, is Wise, formerly TransferWise. And so that might be something that you want to check into as well. Tax time is coming. Is it typical for talent to 1099 their agents for their commissions uh, collected? Um, I'm not sure how it works with agents in the States. I do get a tax slip from my agent in Canada. Uh, I have agents in the US, but I don't do 1099s and, and some of, we, we use different forms because of going Canada to the United States. So I would check with your agent about that because in theory, uh, agent fees should be tax deductible. And that's a question you wanna double check with your accountant because I know that tax laws vary from state to state, province to province, region to region, country to country, et cetera. But I do know here that I can claim the fees on my taxes and so I am able to do that. Same thing with like, like credit card fees. If you're using PayPal or you're using Stripe or some other method to process payments and there's 
what we call merchant account fees that are being deducted, uh, you're able to uh, you're able to claim those as well. And says, I love watching it live on the day. So fun. Well, I'm glad that you are here, Anne, and thank you for joining. And uh, feel free to ask a question if you have got one. Again, for those of you that are joining on Free Advice Friday, maybe you're just popping in. Uh, this is just me hanging out, answering your questions on the business and marketing side of voiceover for free on a Friday. What a concept. Whoever came up with the name Free Advice Friday must be a branding genius. That's the only thing I can figure. So... Uh, if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the comments, and uh, I will certainly do my best to answer that question for you. I can't promise that I'm going to be able to successfully answer every question, but I will fake my way through some of them as well. Uh, you know, I, I like to try. You know, give it the old college try, as they say. And he says, can I ask a question about taxes? Okay, here we go. Is there a list somewhere of things that voice actors specifically or similar can claim as expenses? Okay, so just touching on what I just talked about, it is going to vary from from province to province, country to country, region to region, state to state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always a good idea to double check with your accountant. But generally speaking, on a broad macro level, I am not an accountant. I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Um, generally speaking, the things that are directly related to your business. So for me, I can claim if I go buy studio equipment, Right. If I knew a microphone, an interface, uh, you know, a USB cord that I need to hook something up, I can claim things like that. Office expenses, so you know, printer cartridges and and ink and pen and paper and and some of those standard types of of office supplies would be an example. If you're traveling, so I went to Mavo recently. I'm able to claim uh, airfare, fuel mileage. Uh, rental cars, hotels, uh, meals, different things like that. The conference fee itself is something that you can usually claim. So uh, if you've bought a coaching program from me, if you've picked up one of my classes or if you've done a, a coaching session with me, uh, generally speaking, those types of things related to uh, to your uh, professional development, um, those types of things are, are things that you're able to uh, that you're able to claim. Again, double check with your accountant. Um, and while we're talking about that, a lot of voice actors make the mistake of assuming that they don't need an accountant until they're making a lot of money. And that is actually a really, really false assumption. The reality is that you want an accountant from the moment that you plant your flag in voiceover because in your first year or two, what are you doing? Primarily in your first year or two, you are spending a crap ton of money. You are spending money on coaching on demos, on studio equipment, on websites, on computers, on subscription services like Adobe Audition or you know QuickBooks if you decide to use it, which you don't need to, but if you did, uh, Nimble or some other form of CRM, right? You, it's just money going out. Anybody that's starting in this industry understands. It's just constantly money going out. Again, not an accountant. This is not financial advice, but when you are going through all of those expenses up front, generally you are allowed to operate a business at a loss for a certain number of years because there is an assumption that there's going to be investment in order to get that business up and running off the ground. And so if you are not working with an accountant right out of the gate, you're costing yourself a lot of money in taxes because you're probably paying a lot of taxes that you may not necessarily need to pay because you could have made all of those expenses, uh, claimed all of those expenses. So absolutely, I would say, uh, the sooner that you can start with a good accountant, the better. I would also say that you do not have to have a voiceover accountant. It doesn't specifically need to be somebody who is familiar with the voiceover industry. My accountant is not specifically familiar with the voiceover industry. My accountant is familiar with small business and I am a small business. I can educate him on some of the voiceover stuff that he may need to understand or some of the questions that he may need to ask about specific deductions or, or specific receipts that I've submitted, et cetera. But you do not specifically have to have an accountant that is an entertainment accountant or a voiceover accountant. You just need somebody that understands small business and understands small business and deductions in your state, province, region, country, et cetera. All right, moving on. And says, what are your thoughts on paid ads for podcast promotion, such as Facebook or if there are others? I think that if you can target your audience properly, I think that there can absolutely be an advantage to it. 
in the beginning, you are trying to get discovered and it is really hard to get discovered. It is really hard to get people to find your podcast, listen to your podcast, be familiar with your podcast. And if you don't have a huge following on social media, for example, um, it can be really hard to build that audience up front. Uh, I, I talked about this at Mavo, uh, and, and it was a statistic that blew my mind, and I think it blew the mind of, of a lot of people who were there as well. But in order to be in a top 50% podcast in the world, okay, top 50% in the world, you need 32 downloads in your first week. In order to be a top 5% podcast, in the world, millions of podcasts, a top 5% podcast in the world, 1,153 downloads, which is not crazy when you think about it. It's not like, I think we assume that in order to have a successful podcast, we need hundreds of thousands or millions of downloads, and, and that's not necessarily the case. But getting those downloads initially can be hard. So I had the good fortune when I started the Vopreneur podcast, I already had a bit of an audience, right? There, I had a social media following. I, I had a Facebook group. I had run my blog for years. I, I had an email newsletter, uh, an, an email list that I was able to promote the show to. And so I had that working in my favor. But that being said, have I had episodes in the past where I thought, this is a frigging good episode? And have I run paid advertising on Facebook to try to drive some more traffic to that episode? Absolutely, I have. Um, with Facebook in particular, it's it really can be affordable. Like I have run very successful advertising campaigns on Facebook for some different things strategically at $5 a day, which is not a crazy expense. And honestly, you can do them for less. Uh, but if, if you had an extra 50 bucks that you wanted to flip at Facebook ads to try and drive some traffic to your podcast episode, I don't see why that's not an experiment that I wouldn't give a shot on, of course. Uh, the biggest thing is just targeting the right audience. That's the most important thing, targeting the right audience. How often do you check on statistics such as website visits, demo views, etc.? cetera? Um, this is the wrong answer. So pay no attention to what I say. Um, but for me, the answer is almost never. I just, I got a million things to do and it's never been a priority for me. Should I pay a little bit closer attention? Absolutely, I should pay a little bit closer attention. Do I encourage other voice actors to pay closer attention? Absolutely, I encourage other voice actors to pay closer attention. Uh, that's because I am a better coach than I am uh, 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 at, at following my own advice sometimes. Uh, so let's talk about that for a minute though. Why? Why would there be an advantage to checking on statistics? Okay, if you were adding content to your website and maybe potentially working on building out an SEO strategy, I would wanna be checking the traffic statistics on my website to find out whether or not I'm seeing any growth in traffic, right? That's gonna give me a clue as to whether or not what I'm doing is working. On the flip side, if I'm doing a big push on social media, uh, you know, I'm tweeting out about my voiceover services or my demos or whatever it is and, and putting those links out there all over everywhere, I might want to check my statistics to see, is anybody clicking through? Are we, are we actually driving traffic or am I just, you know, yelling out into the void? Uh, with demo listens, you know, Voice Sam gives you the ability to do uh, Zam, Zam, uh, Zamtistics. Uh, and, and that can be really insightful. What are the demos that are getting the most listens? That might give you an indication of the, your best demo, which might give you an indication of where you should direct your most marketing. On the flip side of that, the demo that's not getting any listens at all, that could be an indication that it's a weak demo. It could be an indication that people aren't liking that demo, or it could be an indication that maybe you're not doing anything to effectively market that demo. So I absolutely believe that there are things that we can learn from checking the numbers. So that's a big part of it. Are you checking the numbers for the sake of checking the numbers, or are you checking the numbers with intention and purpose? And, and I think that's the big difference. If you're going to check the numbers, make sure that you are checking them with, with intention and purpose. If someone listens to a podcast online, does that count as a download or does the file actually need to be downloaded to the device? So I'm not 100% an expert on this, but in most cases, I'll use my show as an example. My show is hosted through Podbean, podbean.com. 
I upload my audio to podbean.com. And then from Podbean, it distributes my show to all of the other channels. So it distributes my show to Apple, it distributes it to Spotify, it distributes it to Google, it distributes it to a hundred different places. Every time there is a request for my episode from one of those services, that counts as a download. That's how, I think that's how it works. So, uh, you know, if, if 500 people listen on Apple Podcasts and 200 people listen on Spotify and 100 people listen on Google and 100 people listen on Amazon Prime uh, and, you know, 100 people listen in a, other random places, you know, then that counts as a thousand downloads, technically. I believe that's the way it works. All right, let's see. Stevie says, how long do you think it will take for a beginner to acquire a thousand quality leads? Tips for being able to do this as efficient and effective as possible. Uh, honestly, it, it, it depends entirely on how hard you want to work at it. Um, if your goal is just finding leads, I mean, a thousand leads, you, you could put that together in, I don't know. Well, uh, okay, here's an example. Uh, I put together a lead list for voiceover marketing playbook. Um, and, and I include, uh, a thousand leads. When you sign up for playbook on the first day, I send you a thousand bonus leads and I get a list built for every playbook release. So I hire somebody to do that for me. Uh, so I would say on average, it's about 40 to 50 hours that I pay my freelancer to build out that list. So use that as a, as a benchmark. Uh, as far as tips for being able to do it more effective and, and more efficiently, I think that's something that you learn over time. I think you get more comfortable with it over time. I think that you learn different tips and tricks and strategies for finding email addresses and things of that nature. That's a big part of what I teach in VoiceOver Marketing Playbook. I, I teach you how to do some of these things. I teach you some of the tricks and, and tips that I use to find leads, find email addresses, you know, find some of the information that I'm looking for. And so one of the ways that you learn how to do things more efficiently is rather than investing uh, you know, a hundred hours of your time trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, you sign up for a course, whether it's mine or somebody else's. Um, and you know, in eight hours, I will give you, you know, three years worth of my education. Uh, and so that's one of the other ways that you build efficiency as well. Look for people who have already figured out all of this stuff and learn from them, let them teach you. And so you're, you're paying them a little bit of money in exchange. Uh, but, but ultimately they're going to give you, you know, an, an education that could potentially save you weeks or months or years. And so I think that's a big part of it as well, but the more that you do it, obviously the easier it gets. And as you do it, you'll start to figure out, oh, that worked, or let me use that site again, or that job title seemed to generate a lot of good leads. Let me do some more searches on that job title. And so just paying attention to your own data and, and following the clues in your own data. You've used the word experiment, which is perfect for small businesses. Are there some must-do experiments for veopreneurs to get started? Um, everything you do on social media is an experiment. Free Advice Friday was an experiment. One day, this idea pops in my head. Hey, I wonder if I go on, at the time I was doing it in Facebook, but I'm like, hey, I wonder if I go on Facebook and do a live stream. Will anybody come and ask questions? Let me see. It was an experiment. And people came and they asked questions. And so I was like, oh, well, that experiment worked. Let me keep doing that. Um, my podcast was an experiment. If I do this podcast, if I take a shot on this podcast, is anybody actually going to download this podcast? And is anybody actually going to listen to this podcast? And that was an experiment that worked. Um, I was talking with somebody earlier in a coaching session today about my, my the ultimate veopreneur subject line. Uh, reference guide, which some of you have probably seen at, at veopreneur.com. Um, this subject line guide, here you go. You go to veopreneur.com. And uh, if you scroll down here, subject lines, stop stressing about subject lines. This guide was a complete experiment. I was literally sitting on the couch watching TV one night. And the idea for this guide popped into my head, like literally out of nowhere, it popped into my head. I was like, Hey, what if I put together a guide that had a whole bunch of subject lines because one of the number one things that voice actors complain about to me in coaching sessions is subject lines. So what if I created this guide and put it together? I'm just gonna put this, by the way, for any of you that are interested in it. 
uh, I'm going to put it in the chat here. But uh, what if I created this guide? It's got, you know, 40 different pre-written subject lines. Would anybody buy it? And so I literally stopped what I was doing, watching the show. I stopped what I was doing. I turned on the computer. I went into Canva. I came up with a bunch of subject lines. I put them into a pretty looking document on Canva and then threw it up on my website and then sent out an email letting everybody know that it was there. Like this whole entire process unfolded in like an hour and a half. And what happened? People bought the guide. It was a really good experiment. It was, it was a chance that I took that worked. Now, on the flip side of that, I made some YouTube shorts. I took some old podcast or some, sorry, some old blogs that I had written and decided I'm going to try to make these into YouTube shorts, see if I can repurpose that content. And my YouTube channel, you know, my YouTube shorts don't get a ton of views. You know, maybe they get a couple hundred views here, a couple hundred views there. Every once in a while, I get one that hits a thousand views or something like that, which is, you know, it's great. It's fine. But uh, the first one that I did for uh, the, the blog, it got like six views, like literally like six views. I was like, what in the world? Like I've never had a video get so few views in the past. Uh, so, you know, that was an experiment that was maybe a failed experiment. The biggest thing with all of this stuff is we wait for perfection and perfection never comes. Let me say that again. We wait for perfection and perfection never comes. So you have two choices at that point. You can either wait for perfection, which never comes, which means that you never do the thing, or you just do the thing and see what happens. And you course correct along the way. My early YouTube videos are garbage, but I would have never got to where I'm at today without those early YouTube videos. My early free advice Friday was me sitting in front of my phone. Like that was it, literally took the phone, sat it, and just talked to the phone on Free Advice Friday. And now I've got lighting, and I've got a microphone, and I've got a mixer, and I've got a little background, and I can make changes on my scenes, and, and I can bring up things, you know, bring up overlays. Like I could do, but I couldn't do any of that. I didn't do any of that stuff in the beginning. It was an experiment. The first ones were experiments. And, and then I learn over time and continue to improve incrementally over time. But I never get to Free Advice Friday today if I hadn't experimented with the original Free Advice Friday in the beginning. So I think you take a chance on some of this stuff. If an idea pops into your head for a piece of social media content, provided that it doesn't like break the law or something, give it a shot. I mean, the worst thing that happens is nobody sees it. Well, crap, nobody saw it. So what? You didn't die. It didn't cause you injury. There's no harm, no foul. But the best case scenario is you throw out one of these videos and it goes viral. And people inquire as to whether or not they can hire you for voiceover. But it doesn't happen if you don't do the experiment in the first place. Quit overthinking and do the thing, right? This is my mantra. Actually, it's stop overthinking. But that's literally my mantra. Those of you that are familiar with me have probably heard me say it a million times. Stop overthinking and do the thing. Stop overthinking and do the thing. Stop overthinking and do the thing and hit the like button right now. Hit the like button. I can see whether or not you're hitting the like button. Nobody's hitting the like button. Do the thing. What can I ask you guys for? What, what, what other questions do you have? And he says, if we want to get better at anything, we have to accept that we will be subpar for a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, your first audition was not your best audition. Your first voiceover demo is not going to be your best voiceover demo. If I went back to some of my early bookings, it is honestly a wonder to God that I ever booked a voiceover ever. Some of those early bookings, the 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 quality of what I submitted was so complete garbage. But people booked me. It's crazy. I don't know what they were thinking. But I've gotten better, right? 
the first audition's not the best. The first demo's not the best. The first booking's not the best. The first website's not the best. I had a conversation with uh, somebody about this yesterday in a coaching session. They were very worried about their website. I said, you want to know something? I said, I'm on somewhere around version 736 of my website. And their jaw hit the floor. When you put a website online, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this because there are people that don't realize this. When you put a website online, do you know what you can do? Change it. When you put a website online, do you know, do you know what you can do? Like five minutes later, update it. When you put a website online, do you know what you could do like next year? Add a new picture. It doesn't have to be perfect. Playbook, great example. I'm on Playbook 3.0. The first playbook I thought was amazing until the second playbook came out. When the second playbook came out, I was like, why did anybody buy the first one? It was so bad. And then Playbook 3.0 came out in April. And I was like, why did anybody buy the second one? Because the third one is so much better, right? Like I'm constantly improving. I update my making money with LinkedIn class every year. Why? Because I always learn, I'm learning something new about LinkedIn every year. And so I can share new information every year. So I'm always, always, always looking for that next thing. So your, your first version of anything does not have to be your last version. And if you're doing it right, you're, you're going to keep incrementally improving. Get 1% better. Get 1% better with every post, 1% better with every video, 1% better with every podcast, 1% better with every marketing email, 1% better with every audition. If you do that, holy crap, you're gonna accomplish some amazing things. So that's my advice on that. I don't even remember what the original question was. Did I even answer the original question? Sorry, I got on a rant there. Every once in a while, you get me going on things and then I, I get lost. What else can I answer for you guys? What else you want to talk about? Did you sign up for the contest yet? Vopreneur.com. I'm just bringing it up right now. 12 VO gifts. Vopreneur.com forward slash 12 VO gifts. Fill out this form. Enter the contest. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas, let me just give you a, a little bit of a rundown. Uh, every day starting December 13th, I will announce a new prize from my 12 main sponsors. Uh, and these on the screen that you see right now are the 12 main sponsors, Joe Cipriano, J. Michael Collins, Anganguza, Cliff Selman, Dave Walsh, Everett Oliver, Uncle Roy, who I believe is watching, uh, George the Tech, K Bess, Hunter Peterson, the Demo Dream Team, and then I throw some prizes in myself as well. Uh, so every day from December 13th, I will announce a new prize, and it all culminates with a live stream right here on this YouTube channel on December 24th at 12 p.m. Eastern. By the way, the link for that live stream is already on the YouTube channel, so you can set a reminder for yourself right now. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. You do not have to be present during the live stream, although we do have a lot of fun, but you do not have to be present to win, so all the winners will be notified. But those are the 12 main prizes, which this represents about $13,000 in prizes, I believe. Uh, but then I'm also in the process now of collecting bonus prizes from some of my other helper elves. Uh, and so I give thanks to Brad Highland, Bob Merkel from Voice Sam reached out to me, Lisa from Impressive Talent, David Alden, my VO coach, reached out to me on Twitter, Ian O'Donnell reached out to me on Facebook, so did Beth Windsor Stewart. I talked to Nimble and they were happy to donate a prize, uh, Jim Franck. Natasha and Catherine, the V123 pros got in on it. Nadia Marshall, I, I did a, actually did a coaching session with Nadia earlier today and uh, said, hey, why don't you join the 12 voiceover gifts at Christmas? Let me talk about your 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 lead course. And so she said, all right, I'll give you one. So uh, Nadia Marshall has donated a course. Uh, so, you know, $18,000 $18, in prizes so far. So vopreneur.com forward slash 12 VO gifts. If you haven't signed up yet, you should go and do the thing. You know, speaking of doing the thing, Sign up, sign up, do the thing. Genevieve says last year was a lot of fun and look forward to it each day. And, and we had a lot of fun on the live stream. Santa Claus was on the live stream. Joe Cipriano was on the live stream. Uh, Bright Voice Studios, Marissa and, and Vanessa were on the live stream. Tim Freelander 
from Nava was on the live stream. Uh, so we, we have some fun. I, th- 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 speaking of experiments, speaking of experiments, the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas, some of you may not know this. The original 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas was actually called the 12 voiceover tips of Christmas. And it was just an idea that I had. I was running a blog at the time. And I said, what if I reach out to some of the people that I know in the industry and ask them to write a guest blog giving a tip for voice actors? And I get 12 of them and I do the 12 voiceover tips of Christmas. And so that's what it was. I reached out to some people, they wrote me some blogs, and then I shared those blogs on my blog. And, and that was, you know, I don't know, six, six years ago, seven years ago, maybe. Uh, that I was doing that. So that was the original, it was just an idea that popped into my head and I thought, I'll roll with it. And then after a couple years of doing that, I got the idea, what if instead of tips, what if I did the gifts? What if I did the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas? Would anybody donate for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas? And so I reached out to some people. And that first year we gave away a few thousand dollars worth of prizes and it was it was crazy. I couldn't believe it. And it has grown every year since. Last year, we gave away $19,125 worth of prizes. $19,125 worth of prizes. But do you realize that last year, $19,000 worth of prizes would never have happened if I hadn't taken a chance on the original 12 voiceover tips of Christmas? It wouldn't have happened if I had done the experiment and asked some people, what about instead of doing tips, would you donate a prize? We would not be here if I hadn't done that. You take a chance, right? You take a chance. Nick says, I'm nearing the point of considering pay to play in my nascent VO career. I hear mixed feelings from the community on these. Can I avoid the pay to play train? Okay, Um, this is a really... Great question and a very loaded question. So let me try to answer this as diplomatically as possible. Pay to plays are going to give you access to audition opportunities. Absolutely. They're going to give you access to audition opportunities that you are not likely to get on your own. And when I say that, I mean because people are choosing to use the pay to plays as opposed to choosing to work directly with voice actors. So you're going to get access to a lot of jobs that you will otherwise not get access to. A lot of people complain about the pay-to-plays because they don't find work or they don't find success or there's too much competition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think there are a couple of things that go into the mix on that. I think that for some voice actors, the reason why they're not finding success on pay-to-play is because they're not auditioning consistently. I think for some voice actors, the reason why they're not finding success on pay-to-plays is because they are not auditioning well. They're not trained up yet. They're not ready Remember, you're competing with the best voice actors in the industry when you do online casting. If you are not prepared to walk into the studio on any given day and do an audition off with the top 25 male or top 25 female or whatever voice actors, you may not be ready. And so that's the reason why it doesn't work for a lot of people. The other thing that I learned after interviewing all of the CEOs of online casting sites was 80%, 8 80% of the auditions submitted have crap audio. And that's a reason why people aren't booking. They don't think their audio is crap, but that's because they've never sent it to Uncle Roy. If they would just send it to Uncle Roy, Uncle Roy could say, nope, your audio's not crap. Or he could say, yep, your audio's crap, but here's how we're going to fix it. But people don't do that. So when you see people complaining about online casting and complaining that online casting doesn't work, you have to ask more questions. Is it that online casting is no longer effective? No. Because there are a lot of voice actors that are making money on online casting. So is the reason why online casting is not working for that particular person something within their control or something without of their control? They're not submitting early enough. They're not submitting often enough. They're not following the directions. Their audio isn't good enough. They don't have proper acting skills. Those are all things that are inside of their control, but they'll blame online casting 
because they'll say, I spent all this money on Voice123 and submitted a bunch of auditions and didn't book anything, and so Voice123 sucks. Well, maybe it's not Voice123's fault. So those are variables that you have to take into consideration. I would say the other thing that you need to think about is that not all, not all online casting sites are created equal. Voice123 is an algorithm-driven site that is freaking confusing, and in my personal opinion, the algorithm is perhaps somewhat unnecessary, but that's another subject for another day. Uh, but the bottom line with that site is you have to completely understand the algorithm in order to successfully use that site. And if you do not understand the algorithm, you are going to struggle on that platform. And the answer is not, is not to throw more money at it, which is what some people will tell you to do. Oh, you just got to pay for the $600 level. Oh, you just got to pay for the $800 tier. Oh, you just got to pay for the $1,200 tier. That's crap. You have to understand how the algorithm works. And if you're not getting the results that you want to see, it might be because you're not using it properly. So you do have to understand the different nuances between some of the different sites as well. So would I say that, that uh, pay to play is not worth it? No, I absolutely would not say that. Would I say that you need to be professional? that you need to have all of your ducks in a row, that your audio needs to be completely on point, that your acting needs to be where it needs to be, that you have to have the ability to audition and follow specs and read direction and do it exactly as they ask and compete with the best of the best. Yes, if you can do all of those things, then you've probably got a better shot at making online casting work for you. And so those are some of my random thoughts on online casting. Play the voice. So much fear of AI replacing VO. Have you thought of any ways that AI can instead enhance your work? Practice scripts, email improvement, etc. You bet I have. I am using AI in a number of different ways. Let me tell you an example. And, and the, the only reason, literally, the only reason why there is a video version of the podcast right now is because I have an AI plugin for Adobe Premiere that allows me to take the three different feeds of the podcast. There's my feed, my guest feed, and then a, a grid feed of the two of us side by side. I am able to use an AI plugin for Adobe Premiere that mixes and edits those three feeds into a full episode. Not perfect, but I was never going to do it. I do not have time. I was never going to do it. And so... That has been the only reason why that video version of the podcast exists is because of that technology. I have used AI, ChatGPT, a thousand different times in a thousand different ways, primarily for brainstorming and idea generation. I will say that I have never used the content, like I've never taken content that it gives me and just that it spits out and just use that directly but I have definitely used it to get the creative process going. I have definitely used it as a launching point. I have used it for ideas and, and inspiration. I've, I've taken concepts that it's given me and thought, okay, I can expand on that. Let me do this or, or whatever. Um, so I definitely think there are ways that it can help us with our workflow, with our efficiency. Uh, I think it can help us with idea generation, with brainstorming, with uh, things of that nature. I mean, I know voice actors that are using AI voice models that they have created that they hold copyright on, which is key, they hold copyright on, to do things like pickups, right? So you record a voiceover, client comes back and says, we need this line fixed, that line fixed, this word fixed or whatever, and they get their AI voice model to spit it out. I don't have a problem with that. If I'm holding the copyright on it, I don't have a problem with that. I think there's a lot I gotta be so careful what I say here. I think a lot of the fear around AI right now is coming as a result of a lack of understanding and education more than it is a reality of what is going on in the marketplace. Now, I could get proven wrong. OpenAI could come out with something new tomorrow that could wipe off, wipe us all off the face of the planet. I don't know. But at this point, I'm not as afraid as everybody, I'm not as afraid of, uh, as a lot of people are. And I have definitely embraced it to help me to do more things, uh, do some things better, do some things more efficiently. 
Uh, and so I think that's for me where it fits into the mix for now. Do I still hope to be doing voiceover five or 10 years from now? Yes, I do. I love it. It's fun. Do I think I will be? Yeah, at this point I do. Uh, but be a good actor. Be a good actor. Don't be, don't do voiceover. Don't do voiceover, do voice acting. Which is something we can all improve on, myself included. And I think that's one of the ways that we future-proof ourselves. All right, everyone, that's it. I gotta go. I got some stuff I gotta do this afternoon, but thank you for watching as always. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Go to vopreneur.com forward slash 12 VO gifts. Make sure that you sign up for the contest. $18,000 in prizes. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, and of course, for any of the other resources that I offer as well, vopreneur.com, you can find them there. Click the store button. There's courses, there's coaching, there's different resources that are available. Everything is at vopreneur.com uh, forward slash uh, store. If you want to see the different coaching offerings, vopreneur.com forward slash store. All right, everyone, as always, whatever you decide to do this weekend, have fun, stay safe, and as always, go find some leads.